Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Janos and I work as a senior software engineer for Red Hat at day and at night I do projects like Container SSH. Today I want to talk to you about Kubernetes. Why do we want to talk about Kubernetes? Of course we are here at Percona Live and we want to talk about databases and databases might seem like a topic that are not naturally fit to run in a Kubernetes cluster and I believe that's a myth and I think we should talk about it. It might also be a good introduction to people who have never ever touched a Kubernetes, never seen a containerized environment. This talk will give you an overview of what you can and what you can't do with Kubernetes. So let's start with a very good example, a database. As you can see, this looks like a database and these databases typically run on some sort of a server. You might run on your laptop as well, but in this case, it's gonna be a server. This might be a physical machine or might be a virtual machine as we see later. To us, what's important is what happens when this machine goes down. And we have to differentiate between different types of outages. One outage might be that the cleaning person entering the data center pulls the plug on the machine and it just simply stops working. What do we do? We go there, we plug in the power cable and everything's back up again. We had an outage, but there is nothing critical. The other kind of outage can happen when um, the server itself has some sort of a damage. So for example, the disk fails. Of course you could put in RAID, but RAID controls also fail. And I have seen a fair number of scenarios when the RAID controller didn't protect from data loss. So that's why you have your backups. Um, I've also seen scenarios where the database engine itself had some problem, for example, the, the disk got full and then the database engine couldn't properly recover from that or the file system had a problem, etc. So there might be failures which are beyond physical hardware. And this is why you of course have backups. But with backups, the problem is it takes time to restore them. So when you restore a backup, then you have to calculate, okay, how much time does it take to transfer all this data back from my backup storage? How much time does it take to import all this data? Is it going to be enough for the business side of things? And you know this better than I do, probably. So what we often do is we create replicas, create more machines. And then when we create these replicas, we have, of course, a replication. And that's usually done as a, um, as a method, for example, you can do either binary replication where you just copy the data that has been changed, or you can do log replication where the transactions that have been run on one database server are then executed on the other database servers as well. And then of course you have synchronous and asynchronous replication and all these fancy things, which is wonderful. It's, it's really wonderful because this enables us to take out one server for maintenance and then we can just have the application run against the other servers. Let me ask you this though, what happens if, if any of these servers go down in terms of data loss, so the server is completely lost, of course your application is gonna stay up, but what you'll end up doing is reinstalling the server, which is going to take time. And if you're using this method as a means of keeping your job, I have some bad news for you. There's this thing called cloud and they have this thing called database as a service. So at some point your company is going to decide that you're too expensive and reinstalling the database all the time is probably not worth your time or is not worth the money they're paying you. So this is not exactly job security. What many companies do to prevent loss of data as much as possible is in, install a very expensive enterprise grade storage with something like fiber channel uh, hardware connected to the physical machine. So one could, for example, then do things like uh, when one host fails, attach over this fiber channel network, attach the virtual disk that's on the storage to, um, to a different server. Or what many companies do is in, put in some very expensive enterprise grade virtualization, such as VMware or Red Hat virtualization or something like that. And I'm not dishing out on virtualization as an expensive platform. Kubernetes can be just as expensive. So don't worry, your enterprise friends are going to have their own solution here. What virtualization enables you to do is, for example, when one physical machine fails, for example, the power goes out, then the virtualization 
platform can transparently move it over to a different physical host that's for example in a different rack or on a different power supply or something like that so you can ensure a fairly high uh, availability with this and then of course the enterprise grid storage itself is also going to be replicated so you don't lose all your data if the storage goes down or if there's a fire in one section of your data center or something like that. One problem with creating a replicated setup, however, is the question of the application because you as a DBA could reasonably assume that application developers should really add support for using multiple database servers in their application. But in practice, that is often not the case. So what we end up doing is adding a very expensive enterprise grade load balancer in front of our setup. And this load balancer is then going to decide where to send the traffic. It depends on, on your database engine, of course, because in with some replication scenarios, you only want to send the writes to the primary database server and the secondary database servers that have a replicated copy only serve reads. So there are some load balancers that support that. You can also build this uh, in a do-it-yourself fashion with HAProxy, etc. So there are many, many solutions here that you can pick. But again, these are things that you will need to evaluate. Let's take a look at what happens when you want to pull out a server for maintenance. Of course, what you do is you configure your load balancer to not serve one of the servers. So pay, take that out of a rotation, then you upgrade the server, and then you put it back into the rotation. Next, you then make do the same steps with the second server, and then you do the same steps with the third server. And that's a wonderful method of taking a lot of time to do a manual job. And again, as I said, there's this thing called cloud, which might end up replacing you if you keep doing this. So this is not exactly job security. You might think so, but it is really not. So let's talk about this thing called containers and why why this makes everything a little different. Let's start with something very simple. How are containers built? A container image, and I'm making this distinction deliberately, there is a difference between a container and a container image. A container image consists of two things. It contains of the application code or binary, depending on what it is, and it contains of the runtime environment. So for example, let's say you're writing a Python application, then you put the Python code in the container image and you put the Python runtime in the container image. This solves a number of problems. For example, you no longer have issues where, oh my God, on the server there's a different Python version and etc. etc. So the container image itself is a self-contained unit and is supposed to be runnable in a fairly flexible manner. So for example, if your application developers package their code into container images, what you want them to do is create a configuration, for example, using environment variables where you can dynamically pass the, for example, the server address and the server credentials to the application. So you can reuse this container image in, uh, in a test setup and use the same container image in a production setup. Now, what you do before you can actually use this container image, of course, you can run it on your laptop, but that's not the point here. You can push them to a container registry. This container registry is a place that stores container images with different versions. You can tag them, so that's basically a version label, so that makes it nice and easy to upgrade and downgrade container images by specifying different version tags. Now, a container image is built from something called a Docker file. And please don't be confused. This is called Docker file for legacy reasons. It is no longer just Docker that supports these. These are now standardized and many, many runtimes can run container images. Let's take a look what things this can contain. For example, this image here, which is from my project container SSH, is built from Alpine Linux. So it takes a base image that's called Alpine Linux. You can, of course, build an image from scratch that is completely empty, and you can put in whatever you want. Then we run this command. This is adding a package to, to this container image, and we're copying in some files and running some commands, etc., etc. So this is a recipe for creating a container image. 
And this recipe can be used to build the container image itself. And that's very important because this is reproducible. So anyone can take this file and recreate the container image, hopefully, if you've done it right, on their own machine. This enables you to standardize things. So instead of manually installing MySQL and then putting in the configuration and whatnot, a container image enables you to standardize that process and check it into a Git repository. So let's see what happens in production. What happens here is the production server has access to the container registry and it can pull the container image and this container image serves as a basis for creating the actual container. And the actual container is a copy of this container image. So every time you start a new container, it's going to start fresh from the container image. And that's on purpose. Now, this is of course doesn't this of course doesn't mean that you cannot save data you can when you start a container mount a certain folder for example your mysql data directory into the container and that is then preserved so when you upgrade mysql you pull a new version of the container image and um, then you use the new version to run it on the same data directory and hopefully then your uh, your container or MySQL in this case will upgrade the data directory to the new version. This is also very nice because it allows you to really reuse container images in many environments. You could use the MySQL container uh, in, in testing, in production, on some sort of a staging environment. You only have to build it once if you do it right. Um, this is, of course, also true for, for application developers. They can also mount folders and store data directly on the disk. But, of course, you want to keep your job, so it's better to tell them to run it in a database. Now, what's this Kubernetes thing then? Kubernetes is something that manages many, many servers. Containers themselves are manual things. So if you use Docker or con directly in ContainerD or some other platform such as Podman, then what happens is you go into a server and on that server you tell the server to pull the image, to run this container, etc. That's a manual process. Kubernetes orchestrates that across many, many servers. So that's the purpose of an orchestrator. And there are, of course, other orchestrators such as Docker Swarm. They used, I don't know if Mesos is still around, etc. Kubernetes itself is built of many, many components. And these are mostly uninteresting to you because you're not going to be the one administering the database. But let's talk about them briefly. So the Kube API server is something that you can contact from your laptop using a utility co called kubectl or kubectl as they often call it and you can give it instructions these instructions can be hey here's a yaml manifest of containers to run or things like that you will see some later in this talk the kube scheduler is responsible for scheduling taking basically deciding where each container is running etc and you can use this not just for running persistent containers such as your database, but you can also use this as running batch jobs. You can you can tell it, hey, run this container once, and in this container, then you put a a script that runs a backup or something like that. And then there's a kube controller manager that does all the controlling and managing. Let's not go into details. And there's of course more stuff like cloud integration, storage integration, and so on and so forth. We'll talk about some of that in a minute. What's important to us is this little component called kubelet. This kubelet is the thing that's running on the actual worker machines. So you run it on the worker machine and it plugs a server into the Kubernetes cluster and kubelet talks to the container runtime and tells it, hey, dear container runtime, I've gotten the instruction to run this, uh, this container, please make it so. So let's take a look at these kubelets slash the worker machines a little more in detail. Let's say we are running a database on one of these workers. This database stores some data on the disk of the worker. Um, this is called host path. We'll talk about why that's a bad idea right now. So what happens if this machine falls over? Of course, the data is again gone. So that problem is not solved. There is no Kubernetes magic that automatically transfers the data to a different server. 
That is not the job of Kubernetes. Kubernetes will restart the database on a different worker, but the data is of course not going to be there. What you can do is, you enterprise friends out there are going to be very happy about this, plug in your very expensive enterprise grid storage into your Kubernetes cluster and that will have a number of benefits. So if you then move your database around from one server to another, your data is preserved and Kubernetes takes care of mounting the volume that you created on your very expensive enterprise storage to the different workers. So you no longer have to go there and mount it manually and things like that. Now in Kubernetes, the disk allocation is done through persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. And the persistent volume part can be created separately. The idea is to separate the requests from a pod. So let's say you are a database administrator, you would create a pod that's running the database. That's the pod is something that can run one or more containers. And then you create a persistent volume claim. Let's say you are going to say you want 80 gigabytes of disk. And then you don't care how that 80 gigabytes of disk is then presented because that is the job of the Kubernetes administrator. So the Kubernetes administrator might then go there and create a persistent volume manually. Or if they have integrated their very expensive enterprise storage with an API, then Kubernetes can automatically create you a persistent volume. And that is a good thing because you can specify certain details of what you want from this storage. Do you want to write it from only one server? Do you want to write it from multiple servers at the same time? Uh, what kind of size you want, etc., etc. So you are decoupled from having to create these disks on your own because either your administrator will take care of it or your integration will take care of it. Your job is only to create the persistent volume claim. So this is how it looks like. We create a persistent volume claim and this persistent volume claim then has a bunch of details. Um, for example, it has a spec for resources. So we're requesting 80 gigabytes of disk here. Um, and then we have access modes and there are a bunch of other parameters. And the metadata name is very important here. If we want to create a persistent volume, this is how we can do it. This one is of course on NFS, which is a really bad idea if you're running a database. But let's say you want to do this and you can create a persistent volume with a specified capacity on an NFS server. And that's going to then take that directory and expose it to your persistent volume claim. So when you start your pod, then you can uh, rely on the disk space being there. Then you can of course create a pod. This one is for example, for starting a MySQL server with a bunch of parameters such as ports and most importantly to us, volume mounts. And as you can see, what we did there is we referenced the persistent volume claim and told uh, Kubernetes that our pod should use this persistent volume claim. And then a little bit further up, we tell the container to use this persistent volume claim as varlib MySQL inside the container. Now, let's talk a little bit about the load balancer side of things because we have these pods, we have a wonderful little storage that's hopefully provisioning things automatically, everything's fine and dandy, but we still want to create load balancers and load balancers are created as services inside of Kubernetes. Services are the general concept of, I want to expose something that may have one or more pods behind it and not just pods as we will see. What we do is we add a little bit of a label to our pod and this label is going to be app MySQL. Then we create this service and we say that we want to expose port 3306 which is the MySQL port and we tell the service that uh, we want to select the app MySQL labels. And if we do this, then the service will automatically take a look in the Kubernetes cluster, take a look where there are pods with this label and will them add them to an internal load balancer or as you will see, also possibly an external load balancer. So basically the good news is Kubernetes includes a load balancer. And this is done using some heavy lifting from the Linux kernel, of course. Um, so again, to reiterate what happens here is when we create a service, 
there we specify the selector which pods to select and any pod that has that label will be added to that load balancer and there of course then things like health checks and and stuff like that so you can specify health checks that let you shut down the pod gracefully now again talking about our wonderful little pods what can we do because we have created these pods manually so far so what we want to do is instead of creating each pod manually which is again a nice way to create unnecessary busy work is we want to create these pods automatically from some sort of a template some sort of a definition this is especially useful when we want to do replication what we can do here is something called a replica set a replica set is something that can run a number of copies of the same pod template so we basically specify our yaml how we want it and the replica set will take care of starting a number of pods but of course replica sets are not the only thing we can do let's think about maintenance what is the, what happens if we want to update our pods and that's where deployments come in what deployments can do they can um, automatically create two replica sets and start scaling one down and one up in order to gracefully start replacing pods with newer versions so let's say when you are updating your database to a newer version what you can do is you create a deployment and then you update basically when you are uh, specifying the new image version then the deployment will take care of scaling down the original replica set and then successively scaling up the new replica set now one more important thing with um, deployments is that they are not guaranteeing in which order things are going to be started and that's going to be a problem if your database replication requires that you start servers in a certain order for example you have one primary server and a bunch of secondary replicas and you need the primary server to start first and that's where the stateful set comes into play the stateful set basically gives you the ability to run pods in a certain order so when we're talking about applications what you can do is you have pods from your application developers they go to the service and those go to your database pods and you can layer as many as you want on these and you can create a wonderful microservice dependency hell if you so desire so what happens if you want to expose your MySQL externally, for example, because you decided that you need to provide service to some applications that are not yet in Kubernetes? What you can do is create, for example, a load balancer service. And this load balancer type service is different than the previous one in that, that it creates an external IP address and port available to, uh, to access your MySQL database. There are, of course, other methods. So if you are looking to allow HTTP requests into your application, then you might want to look into an ingress resource, which is much more capable for routing HTTP requests. But for a database, you typically want to look at a load balancer. You can also use the type node port. The node port type is a little bit different because it exposes the server on, uh, it exposes the, the service on the physical server the node port is a little different because it exposes the service on the host machine directly on a uh, on some sort of a port that uh, that it the node port is different because it exposes the service on the host machine where the pod is running on a port that you specify Please keep in mind that the node port might be limited to a certain port range so you can't necessarily expose everything on port 3306 because some ports here are reserved so one more thing we can do is use the service to access external databases because you might have databases that are outside your kubernetes cluster and what you want to do is provide this database as a service to your applications already running in Kubernetes. And this can also be done, for example, using a headless service. And for example, here I added an external name type of service where the external name 
is the domain name pointing to the MySQL server. And that makes it very easy for your application developers to reference the service, or if you have some sort of an auto discovery mechanism, that is also possible. Now, you might, of course, look at Kubernetes as the typical thing that's on the peak of inflated expectations on the Gartner hype cycle. Um, and to a certain extent it is. And there are many, many stories of Kubernetes failures and companies are struggling to implement it because it is very complex and you need trained professionals to, to run it. And the most important thing here is that there is no one Kubernetes. We, of course, at Red Hat sell OpenShift. There is Rancher, there is Cops. You can use KubeADM to deploy it, KubeSpreyKind, and there are a litany of other providers. Kubernetes is more like a Lego building block. So you can put, take it, put it together any way that you want. Each cloud uh, service, of course, have, has their own Kubernetes distribution because they integrate it with their cloud provider. So the, there's a wide field of possible Kubernetes deployments. You can either go build it yourself with KubeADM or KubeSpray, or you can pay Rancher or Red Hat for the privilege if you so desire. And of course, there are open source variants of both Rancher and Red Hat OpenShift. So there is a wide range of uh, things that you can do here. So what if you want to try this out for yourself? Of course, you can use the Docker desktop, which is a wonderful Kubernetes distribution for just playing around. Or if you're running on a Linux machine, I can highly recommend K3S. K3S is from the wonderful folks over at Rancher, and it is a miniature Kubernetes distribution. And it really is just this much to install. You run this little script you download from their website, and in about 30 seconds, you will have a working Kubernetes cluster. And that's all I have for you. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them.